and uh, welcome to this uh, presentation here at the uh, Northboro Library. For those of you who haven't been here before as part of this series, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney at Myra O'Connell. There are 70 of us there, biggest firm outside of Boston. Um, and because there are 70 of us, everybody kind of gets to do what they like. I, I, 20 of us practice here in Westboro. I do nothing but elder law. Um, these presentations I've, I've we've used to deal with some specific elder law issues. Um, what I decided to do this fall was to focus on um, a couple of, or kind of a basic issue more holistically. That sounds like really big time. Um, but the notion is that we want to take, the, if you've been here before, you've seen, I always talk about my make-believe couple, Frank and Mary, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and I always tell people it's their goal in life is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And if they live in Northboro, the question is, how do they do that in Northboro? So what I wanted to try to do today, oh, and I just remembered, if anybody afterwards wants to sign up, I got a sign up sheet so that I can email you when, when these things are coming up as opposed to mailing, I'm glad to do that, it's over there. So what I, what I wanted to do today was just talk about Frank and Mary, um, who are in this picture kind of a little bit older and, and talk about them at different ages. So I want to start off by talking about Frank and Mary when they were a little bit younger, at age 70, and talking about, so say Frank and Mary, and they've just retired, you know, and their kids are grown up and stuff, and the question is, what, if anything, should they be doing? What should they be doing in terms of who should they be meeting? What should they be knowing about? There are kind of a set of things that they should be doing, uh, even though they're both healthy and fine and all of that jazz, and maybe especially because they're healthy and fine. And then in the second part of this presentation, we're going to talk about Frank and Mary at 80, when they are a little bit older and still living at home. But now, you know, things are getting a little more creaky and they're not feeling quite as great, you know. And then the question is, so what should they be doing then? Uh, and then in the second presentation, which will be in about a month, um, we're going to talk about Mary at 90, because Frank has died and Mary really is now getting older. Um, and, she's, and, and, and the question is, what does she need to be doing to try to stay at home no matter how frail she gets? And how does she deal with the last year of her life? That's the kind of the last piece of the pre that presentation is how, how you make the last year of your life as good as it can be. Typically, that's not going to be a great year. That's just the way it is, right? But how do you try to make it as good as it can be? So for Frank and Mary right now, um, they are 70. Uh, and, and they're living in North Grove and they have a small house and that's why it's only priced at $300,000. Um, they have a savings account worth $300,000. Frank has an IRA of $200,000 and they're living off their social security checks, right? Frank's getting $2,000 a month. Mary's getting half of his, $1,000 a month. And they just want to stay where they are, right? They really like what they're doing. And, and so the question is, what, do they want, what should they be thinking about? Well, first, they want to be thinking about this. So Frank's actuarial life expectancy at age 70 uh, is 14 more years. He's got 14 more years to live. And Mary has got a little, almost um, 17 years to live. Right? And so it is, it is always, there is a habit among folks as they're getting older. And you know, I'm going to be, I'm very sensitive to this presentation. I'm turning 70 in January, right? There is a habit among all of us as we get older to spend more and more of our time looking back, saying, oh, remember how good I felt 10 years ago? <laughs> you know, remember all the things we did? Remember the kids when they were little? And that's all great. But I think a real challenge for seniors, and this is really one of the subtexts of this presentation, is to kind of get over that and say, that was a, that's all great, except that was then. And so the real question is, looking forward, looking forward to those next 14 or 15 or 16 years, how is that going to work out? And how do I plan so that that's working out as well as possible? How do I accept the fact that, that there really is an end, I don't want to say it's in sight, but it's not like theoretical anymore, right? You get to that point in your life where you know you, that you actually really will die at some point, right? And you know, your kids, don't believe that, right? You talk to them. So then it's like totally theoretical. Oh no, you're dying. That's just right. But you get to a certain point, you say that's a piece of it. So the question is, what are all of the things that you need to be kind of thinking about? Now, 
to help you, be, you hear about that, I've asked several um, panelists to come in. Uh, one of them, Sarah Bork and, and her partner, Rebecca Wild Wesley, are geriatric care managers. And I want to introduce you to the concept of what a geriatric care manager is. Because the earl earlier that you meet a person who is a geriatric care manager, the better. Not because you need that person's help right now, but because you may have a sense of what you might need in the future. Um, I, I have also asked my, my, my good friend Doug Pack from Seniors Helping Seniors to be talking to you because um, Doug um, works with an organization, a, a home care entity, um, all of whose employees are seniors. It, the concept is that they're seniors helping seniors. And so for, if you're Frank and Mary in your 70, you may be wanting to work for him, right? This is an ad, right? If you're older, you may be wanting somebody that works for him to be coming over and helping you out. So I want you to kind of understand that, right? Uh, and then many of you have already met Christine Alexander. Christine runs a Bay Path Elder Services, the, the, the Aging Services Access Point, or ASAP, that covers this whole area, the 26 communities in this area. And that is basically the conduit for all federal and state money for seniors. They actually really run Wheels on Wheels, the original Older Americans Act program that was created by Lyndon Johnson back in the 1960s. But it's way beyond that. It's like when senior centers talk about beyond bingo. I mean, the Bay Path is way beyond Meals on Wheels. So she can be talking to you about, once again, both Frank and Mary at 70 and Frank and Mary at 80. So that's who we're going to be talking to. Um, once again, 70 is just the beginning of the rest of your life. It's the beginning of the rest of your life. And that's kind of how you want to be thinking about this. So what do you want to be doing and where do you want to be going? Just if you're taking a day and you're 70, well, the first thing is <clears throat> you want to be going to your senior center. Um, and you want to be going to the senior center. You want to be getting in touch with a, with a geriatric care manager, I think. Uh, and you want to know who the ASEP is. The senior center, this is a good reason. I mean, it just, especially in Northbrook. How many, raise your hand if you've been to the senior center. Uh, a few haven't, right? You've got to see your senior center. It's just fabulous. I mean, it's got a great restaurant with great food, it's got great programs. There's, you know, it's like, once again, it's, like, it's not bingo. I mean, it is, but it, you know, that's one of a jillion things that happen at the senior center. It's food, it's health with issues. If you've got, if you've got Medicare slash, you know, drug type issues and you're trying to figure them out, that's where the shine counselor works. The shine counselor who is, who is trained by the state to help you figure out not only your best drug plan, but your best Medicare plan. Many seniors still are not aware of how many different kinds of Medicare plans there are. There's basic A and B, Medicare A, Medi Medicare B, there are supplementals, but then there are all these al alternate plans that might be right for you. And, and the wonderfulness of Medicare is that A, there are no pre-existing conditions you can change any time, and B, it's like open enrollment, like every fall, like right now. You can change not only your drug plan, but all of this. And the Shine Council can help you figure all that out. In the springtime, they've got tax people that can help you figure out your taxes. They get educational programs all the time. And they can point you to the resources that you might need. Like, for example, the folks at, at the ASAP, at, at Bay Path Elder Services. But you want to know about these people before, think, before you need them, before you need them. So I want to start off by talking, by having Sarah Burke talk to you a little bit about a geriatric care manager. Many, many seniors still have never heard of that, uh, are unaware of that concept. And I think it's really important. I regularly refer people to geriatric care managers because they're the people whose job is to know, to be able to talk to you and figure out kind of what your situation is and then to know all of the different resources that might be available um, through various entities and kind of know how to compare those in terms of trying to help you figure out if there's anything there that you want. That's their job. You know, going to the, what in the old days used to be called the yellow pages, you know, looking around for any of this stuff is impossibly difficult. So I want, I'd like to ask Sarah to talk to you about this a little bit. Sarah. Okay. Once again, this is my tech lesson. 
That's forward, that's back. All other questions I can't figure out. So here you go. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully I can manage that much. So I am not Rebecca Wild Wesley. I am Sarah Bork. I work with Rebecca Wild Wesley at the Aging Space. I am a. Oh, I ruined it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I am, an, I am a nurse. I have a master's in psychiatric nursing, actually, and I am a CDP also and a certified care manager. So what is a care, who are care managers? Care managers are healthcare professionals. Many of us are nurses or mental health uh, or social workers. Some of us are um, PTs or OTs or maybe a, a uh, healthcare clinician, a mental health clinician. We have all worked for a number of years in the aging population or with the aging population. Um, many of us belong to, we're actually now, we call ourselves aging life care professionals. There's a association called the Aging Life Care Association, which gives us guidelines and um, codes of ethics. There's a test through that which makes us certified. Um, and we have areas of expertise. So our areas of expertise, crisis intervention, health and disability, financial, housing, family, local resources, advocacy, and legal. So those are, those are the areas that we bring to you. And how do we do that? We bring that to you as advocates, as partners, as eyes and ears. If you have family, kids are at a distance, we might be the eyes and ears for the families. We will um, join you for medical appointments if that's needed. Um, help you look if you come, if you get to a point where you're looking for a different living situation, uh, something like that. We'd help you find the right place. We always start with what are your goals? Do you want to stay at home? Um, and then looking at how things are set up. So at age 70, Frank and Mary probably are still fairly healthy, ideally. Um, they are living at home. Their ability to get around is pretty good. They're both still driving. One of them may still be working. Um, one, they may be retiring or thinking about retiring and trying to think about what's next. Often one of the first steps that we encourage people to do is to actually see an aging or a elder care attorney to make sure that the just very basic paperwork is in place in case something unexpected happens. So your health care proxy and your power of attorney. That way, if something that you're not expecting happens, you have those things in place, somebody can step up and help make decisions Well, maybe you can't for a while. We would look at with you at um, how you want to spend your time. I mean, it may be that you don't know about your senior center or an adult day health program or volunteer or even paid positions that are not what you've been doing all along, but you can still keep busy and, and, and active. Um, I think that's probably it for the basics at 70. And we're going to talk. You're going to talk some more when. We're and yes, and we'll talk. I'll talk some more about when Frank or Mary are eighty. When, Fra when they're yeah. eighty, yes. So thank thank you very much. So and the other person, as I had mentioned, that I think you ought to meet, and, and if you ought to meet him now, right? Um, especially if you're interested in helping in helping other people, uh, is Doug Peck. You should meet the folks from Seniors Helping Seniors. I've known Doug for a long time, but I, I wanted him to talk to you about kind of the, the that what you should be thinking about, Doug. Hi, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Doug Peck. I work for a company. As a matter of fact, I owned a, a franchise of this company for a few years in this area. I now work, we combined it with the uh, franchise in Boston, and so we now cover from the Boston to the Metro West uh, area. And really, it's, it's, it is, was founded on the principle that really most people would like to stay home as long as possible. At least, particularly when they're 70, that's what they're thinking about. And um, you know, we, we try our best to keep you there, knowing the different kinds of help that you may need. Um, so I, I try to keep things simple. I look at basically, you know, uh, there's usually one or two reasons why somebody needs help at home. And it really can come at any age, whether you're 70 or 80, 
but there's usually a, a new diagnosis or an incident of some sort that, that occurs that then impacts you on a daily basis. Uh, it could be you need a hip replaced and you're going to go into the hospital and come back, but you're not gonna be able to do everything, at least for a time being, that you were able to do before that. Or a knee, or uh, earlier this summer, um, uh, I'm uh, what I considered, to be, I thought I was a very healthy uh, <laughs> 72. Uh, I had a stent put in and it was a total surprise to me. Everything was worked out great, but you know, the unexpected happens and you know, the unexpected happens actually all the time. <laughs> That's why they call it the unexpected. So I, th I really, what we're talking about here, particularly at 70, is being a little bit prepared uh, for that. Because when you're not feeling good and you become less active, you become more isolated, but you also really don't feel like making big decisions. You know, it could be about anything. But, you know, if, if my wife would ask me, do you want to do this or that? And I would, you know, particularly the first week or two afterwards, I don't care whatever it is you want to do. But what, what's really important when it comes to getting care is you want to be involved in that decision-making process or at least think about it early on. I uh, also volunteer for the Alzheimer's Association and I do a presentation called Know the Ten Signs, Why Early Diagnosis is So Important. I'm not gonna talk about Alzheimer's today, but one of the key reasons you want to be thinking about it early is to say to yourself, so who would I want helping me? Who do I have around me now? Because we are all living in an era, an era when families are scattered, uh, friends get scattered, they start to get scattered at 70 or so, and you need to be thinking about, about it and make some decisions. Who would I really want at least in your own mind, to be uh, going through the list and see, do I have three or four close friends that I could call on? Uh, if I need to bring in help, who would they be? Um, do I want to meet them beforehand? Um, for me, again, I break it up pretty simply into two areas. One are sort of traditional caregivers, and when you think about people coming in, you think about um, CNAs, certified nursing associates, personal care attendants, uh, people that are generally task oriented that are going to help you around the house, do the laundry, um, make beds, clean the house, etc. Do all those kind of task things. My business is really around what I call non-traditional, and that is people that come in who are companions or um, what I call a friendly neighbor, and. Um, some people have friendly neighbors, some people still live in neighborhoods that are still fairly vital. Uh, it's also a good reason to be at a place like the Senior Center um, where, you, where you keep your social networks up and you have people that can give you a ride to the doctor when you need it. Um, we'll go pick up groceries if you can't get out of your house or, or just even come over and sit with you. Um, I got in this business about eight years ago when my father had passed away and my mother wanted to stay at home. Uh, and uh, I live in Southboro, she lived in Ashland, not all that far away, but I was always going over there. She always had a to-do list for me. But it was actually my wife that really taught me the most. She said, look, she doesn't care if you get all these jobs done or not. She wants you to go over and just sit, sit with her for a little while, have a cup of tea, sit and talk. And I'm saying, I got a million things to do. I'm working full time. <laughs> you know, I have the house here to take care of in Southboro. The house there, which is, had, hadn't been really taken care of for a long time, needed a lot of work. So we looked at other, bringing other people in that could help do the other work so I could really sit and have a cup of tea with her. Because it's that social isolation that comes about when you're just not as mobile. Again, um, Probably at 70, it's not a big impact, at least not for the long term, but it might be for the short term. Um, because, you know, right now, it really does take a village to help somebody stay where they want to stay. Because it's a, it's a society that's, that requires you to have good transportation, and you may not be able to drive for a while. We've driven lots of people 
who have had knee operations or foot surgery or something, and they just can't drive for a few months, but they need to get out of the house. And what they found, a lot of them, is they also enjoy having somebody else drive for a while, having somebody else different to talk to because they have been a little bit isolated. When, when things become, when, when people get close to 80, things are changing a little bit. One of the things about a friendly neighbor that I, I want you to think about is what Arthur mentioned as well, uh, is if you are healthy, the people that work for us, our average age is 67 or 68. Our oldest companion is 90. And you know, they all tell me that they get as much from helping the people than uh, themselves than the people get from them. Because it's a very rewarding uh, type of position to have. We are, we are, as humans, wired to be social, but we're also finding out we're wired to be kind. And it's just a really, you should think about, if I have the ability now, paying it forward a little bit can go a long way. So up next is Christine. Hi. Thank you, Doug. You're welcome. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see everybody. So I'm from an agency, Bay Path Elder Services. How many people in here are elderly? Not too many. We don't think of ourselves as elderly. No. So the name of my agency, I think, needs to be changed because we don't refer to people as elderly. Even my mother, who is 86, going to be 87 next week, says she is not elderly. Don't call her that. She's an older adult. But with Frank and Mary at age of 70, even if they are going to the senior center, even if they may babysit the kids once or twice, twice a week, why would they need Bay Path at 70? Because most folks associate Bay Path with the fact that we do Meals on Wheels and the fact we have a home care program that allows someone to come into your home and give you some assistance with your homemaking. And that's not you. But Bay Path is much, much more than that. If you're 70, you want those opportunities to remain engaged and active in your community. So there's a number of opportunities that we might have that you might be interested in volunteering because volunteering is one way to give back to your community. You, I'll bet that you don't know that we serve, we deliver over 500 meals a day in our 14 communities. That's a lot of meals. And it's a route to deliver meals is about 10 to 12 people. So we use an, an enormous number of volunteers to get these meals out. And it's really something that people are invested in. It's an opportunity for you to give back and to make some friends along the way as well. We also have a money management program where you could volunteer to be a bill payer for somebody, help them manage their checkbook, help them arrange their bills, get their checks signed. Because for many people, Money management is the difference between staying at home and going into a nursing home. And we also have an ombudsman program that relies on volunteers. Ombudsmen are the individuals who go into long-term care facilities and are advocates for the residents of a long-term care facility. You also might want to take advantage of our healthy living programs. What is a healthy living program? Well, a healthy living program is an evidence-based program that means it has passed muster and has been validated to show an impact on an individual. Has anyone taken a program called a matter of balance? That's a program that can help you avoid falls. We have a diabetes self-management program. We have a chronic pain self-management program. And these are all evidence-based programs we make available out into the community that you might be interested in attending. Employment opportunities. Doug just talked about senior to senior. You might want to still work, but not full time. We often hire individuals who just want to work on a part time basis. Maybe a receptionist, maybe an administrative assistant. Can our information and referral department help you find some employment opportunities as well? So I always say, know us before you need us. And on the flip side, what if you have an aging parent, an aging aunt? Even at 70, you may have a parent still living. And my mother is 86, I'm over 60, 
and I'm a long distance caregiver for my mother. She lives in New Jersey. And I have a geriatric care manager working with my mother. And I gotta say, it's been a godsend. It has been an absolute godsend. I could not do it without her. But I still have to go down about once a month and help my mom. So Bay Path can, can provide you information and referral. So if you have a parent that lives in the town next door, that would be great. We can tell you all about local resources. And if your parent is out of state, like my mother, we can also help you by getting you the information on who to contact in your state for services. I must say, my mother lives in New Jersey. The aging network is very different down there. There are no ASAPs. So for me to be out into the community talking about my agency that does so much, I then go down to New Jersey and it's, it's really night and day. So again, know us before you need us. We also have a caregiver program. If your mother or father lives in the town next door, you're taking care of them or they live with you and you are overwhelmed, call our caregiver program. We can help arrange for respite. We can get you into support groups. We can get you education, training. You don't have to go it alone because oftentimes a caregiver will pass before the care recipient. And we know a caregiver needs to take care of themselves. And lastly, for that aging parent, getting them in-home services. Services such as homemaking, personal care, medical transportation, grocery shopping. With my mother, I have to order groceries online. She sends me a list through the mail because she doesn't have internet. So she sends me a handwritten list through the mail and I, ca I call up ShopRite. I, actually, I go online for ShopRite and then have it delivered to her house. So we tried this for the first time the other week and they delivered the groceries. Now, we got my mother a jitterbug. It's one of those new smartphones that has a really big face and she's, she wanted it, but she's very afraid of it. She doesn't know how to use it. But she texted me. This was her first text. And it said, I got the goodies. Thank you so much, it was great, LOL, mom. So I called her up that night and I said, I, I was really in, practically in tears, I was so proud of her and I told her how proud I was. And I said, but you put LOL. She said, yes, that means lots of love. <laughs> okay, mom, between you and me, it's lots of love. So in-home services, opportunities, know us before you need us. We're up in Marlboro, my contact information is there. If you just want to call me and chat, that's perfect. I welcome your call. So I'm turning this back to Arthur. Thank you very much, Christine. So they're really good, <laughs> right? All the folks up here are just really good. I think, I think the, the, in general, thematically, yes, you should be connecting with them because it might be something that, that you could use right now. Um, you can definitely be connecting with them because for so many of us here, at, that, at, the, at age 70, you are taking care of somebody else. A lot of, I bump into this all the time, all, just all the time. Um, and then one, once you know that they're there, like you're in their system, like the geriatric care manager knows you or you've signed up at Bay Path. So like they know who you are, they know what your address is. So if there's an issue that comes up later on, it's really easy for them to deal with you. So now, Back when Sarah talked about the, 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 uh, the fact that it's 70, a lot, a lot of folks actually do. They start talking about legal issues and they'll often come in and talk to me about, you know, don't I need this, don't I need that? And the answer is usually, you don't really have to have very much of anything, right, at that point if you're Frank and Mary. Um, because you're Frank and Mary, you're both alive, chances are your assets are owned by the two of you jointly. So that if one of you dies, that person's interest evaporates and the other person becomes the sole owner. So there is no probate in that case when the first of the two of you dies. If your assets, like Frank and Mary's, are less than a million dollars, there are no estate tax issues, so you don't have to figure out how to rearrange anything in order to save on your estate tax. And as I'm gonna talk about a little bit later on when we talk about Frank and Mary at, at, um, at 80, um, if, if, a, a, if many people come in, many, 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 and they're all worried about nursing home care, and oh my God, don't I need to move all of my assets out of my name and create an irrevocable trust? And the answer to that is all no, except in very, very limited circumstances, because while you're both alive, if one of you needs nursing home care, you can do all of that asset shifting at the last minute. So you don't have to plan way, way ahead of time for all of this stuff, right? So, so the main thing is really keeping control, keeping control. 
Um, and one of the reasons why that's so important is, is this. Is remember when we were growing up, you know, well, I, there are a lot of people here that are about my age, right? Remember when we were growing up and somebody like had a heart attack and they died, right? Or somebody had a stroke and they died. People had that, people would just die, right? And it doesn't seem like that happens anymore. Look at the number. In 1970, if you had a stroke or a heart attack, your likelihood of being dead within 14 days was 33%. Right? Now it is 3%. That's what's changed. So that your planning, especially when you're Frank and Mary and you're 70, is really, you're not worried so much about that kind of like sudden death. It happens, but it's just really rare. What you're really worried about, you have one of those incidents and now you're not feeling as great, right? Or you're not feeling as great as Doug had suggested for a little while. So you need to deal with that. So you really only need two things. You need two things. You gotta have it. Have to have a power of attorney, have to have a healthcare proxy. I guarantee you, well, I'm going to ask, how many people here have a power of attorney? Raise your hand. Like just about everybody. How many people here have a health care proxy? Raise your hand. Like just about everybody. So all I'm t telling you is, is a couple of things about those documents that you may want to check. Because um, all part of powers of attorney are not the same. First, if you have a power of attorney and you're getting to be our age, you want to make sure that that power of, and because ch chances are that power of attorney gives the power to the spouse, Frank to Mary and Mary to Frank, right? Um, one of the things you want to make sure is that if there is an emergency and assets need to be shifted around from Frank to Mary or from Mary to Frank, that your attorney has the ability to do so. And the reason why I mention that is that it, it, unless it is said in your power of attorney that the person that you named as your attorney has the power to give assets to himself or to herself, even if it's your spouse, right, that power is not implied, right? So it has to be stated in the power of attorney. That's really important. I find myself, you know, oftentimes having to move around assets from one spouse to another where, where the, the, the spouse who's healthy will show me the power of attorney and there's a limitation in the power of attorney that says, um, you, can, uh, you, can give assets that the, that the, you can give assets to anybody or to yourself but not more than what's called the federal gift tax limit, which I won't go through the fact that, that there is no federal gift tax limit, that's a separate talk. The, but the point is, that number is actually $15,000 a year. If I find myself at the last minute needing to move the house from one spouse to the other, or bank accounts from one spouse to the other, and I'm stuck with that limitation, I can't do it. So I can't get the six spouse qualified for mass health. So you wanna check that. Uh, the second thing is, you, oh, it, it, you get to this age, a lot of folks come to me and they have an old power of attorney, so they named each other, but they didn't name anybody else. So you gotta face up to it, right? At our age, you gotta name somebody else. <laughs> you need to make sure that if you're unhealthy and so is your spouse, or your spouse is unavailable, or whatever, there is somebody else that can stand in, typically one of your kids and you can actually name more than one of your kids at the same time. You can name them jointly and severally so that if you need to have someone handle something for you, your spouse is sick, maybe you got into an accident so she's not doing so great either, that and one of your kids is around and the other one isn't because they're on vacation, they're far away, any one of the kids could then stand in for you because you can name multiple attorneys or multiple uh, agents jointly and severally. Um, regarding the healthcare proxy, same thing as I just mentioned regarding the power of attorney. You just want to make sure you name an alternate. So you name your spouse, if you're going to name your spouse, and probably name one of your kids as the successor if your spouse can't do it. Or as you get older, and I'll kind of me be mentioning this later, um, as you get older, you may actually want to name your child as your, on the healthcare proxy as your principal agent. So why is that? Because if, if, if I'm Frank and Mary, and Mary is going in the hospital, do I really want to be talking to the doctors all the time? I think I'd rather just be with Mary. As long as I've got a child that I can trust who's going to be dealing with all that stuff, that way it just takes some stress off of me. So I'm just mentioning those are the documents that you really have to have. Now we're going to talk about uh, Frank and Mary at 80. So Frank and Mary at 80, they've done okay. Things are still rolling along. Frank now still has uh, a life expectancy of 8.3 Four years. Now remember, he just got uh, 10 years older, but his life expectancy only shrank by like seven years. Mary still has a life expectancy of almost 10 years. Similarly, her li your life expectancy does not shrink 
a year for every year that you live. By virtue of you're still standing, there's more likelihood that you're going to keep standing, right? But the point is those numbers are smaller now, right? And now the likelihood is, there's certainly no guarantees in this life, right? But the likelihood is within a decade they're going to be dead, right? So they want to be starting to think about making sure that, issue, that, that issues around that and that during the, this time, chances are there's going to, period, going to be a period where they're not going to be well. Because while they wish they could just drop dead, they're not going to. Remember, their chances of dying from the two things that make you drop dead, heart attack and stroke, are 3%, right? If, all of a sudden. So they want to be thinking about, first, how can they be staying as healthy and active as they can during these times so that that last period before they die is as short as possible. And then secondly, they want to kind of make sure that they're keeping themselves safe. So they want to be talking to that geriatric care manager or to the, or to the folks at the senior center or the folks at the ASAP about a whole bunch of issues. Maybe they want to find somebody who can look at that house where they want to live until they die and see if the house is safe to live in. Right? As I always tell my clients, you know, you can live to be a very old age, just don't fall. Just don't fall. You fall, you break that hip. It's a one-way road after that. So, so, and, that's, and so you need to think about that. How can you make your house more safe so that the, even though your lot is l l nimble, you can still have it? Um, do you need somebody on occasion in the home? Do you really need to be going down to the cellar to do the laundry still where the washer and dryer still is? Do you really want to be doing that? you know, at a certain age? You know, do, do, do you really want to be going out and doing the shopping? There's a point at which, and I know for all of my clients, they say, oh, but I don't want to spend money on that. I can do that. Yeah, I get it. Except that, is it safe? You know, is it safe for Frank and Mary who've got some extra money, right? Or isn't it more sensible for you to use the money in those ways? Fine, assisted living. You want to figure out, is there a point at which you need to be moving or should be moving to assisted living because it's safe, because you'd love to stay at your home, but no matter how much you adapt it, there's still snow outside on those stairs every winter. You know, you're not gonna get around that. There are some certain things that you just can't get around being in your home. So you may be wanting to talk to somebody about that. So I wanna start off by bringing Sarah back here to kind of talk about the issues that might come up that Frank and Mary may be raising for her uh, when she's 70. Uh, I'm going to ask Doug to talk about that, and, and then I'm going to talk, ask Christine to talk a little bit about the programs that would be available for Frank and Mary, at, excuse me, when they're 80. Uh, and then I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about law. Thank you. Ah, I don't have slides for you. Yeah, you do. That was, that was it. That was it. Ah. I have that's that slide. It. Yes, that's the slide. <laughs> that's the slide. So I'm going to back up just a little bit about what we are. One of the things I didn't mention is that we're privately paid, so we're hired by you or by your family, maybe your kids, again, at a distance, um, who want to make sure that there are eyes and ears on the ground here making sure that you're safe. Um, Long-term care insurance sometimes will also cover our costs. So I'm going to start at the bottom of the slide. One of the things that you're often going to see are, as you age would be declines in health, declines in mobility, declines in vision. I think that's, well, I guess that's not up there, actually. Um, so those kinds of things make navigating your world a little bit more difficult. Um, <clears throat> you're more at risk of falling. Getting in and out of the shower gets a little bit more difficult. Uh, getting, just getting things done around the house are, is harder. So as a care manager, I would be talking with you again always thinking about what are your goals, what do you want? Can we make this, is this really where you want to stay? Is that, are you committed to this? How can we make this work? Is it picking up um, throw rugs? Is it making adaptations, adding uh, grab bars in the bathroom, maybe uh, making alterations to the bathtub so that you can get in and out or the shower, maybe helping you find um, a resource, uh, seniors helping seniors or more traditional kind of caregiver to help you in the home. As a care manager, we're, we're resource specialists, let's say. So we know a lot of the different um, 
agencies in the area, if you look in the yellow pages, there are 100 agencies that you could find. Over time, we know the different agencies, we develop relationships with them, we can help you make good matches in terms of the costs of the agencies, which vary a little bit, although much, you know, most of them are similar, but also the personalities and how they work and what your needs might be. We, medical appointments get more complex, your healthcare gets more, more complex, you're juggling many different medications, so, it's often helpful to have an extra set of ears, an extra person asking questions and being able to help explain it in a way that you can understand. So we might go with you to medical appointments. If you can't drive, we might drive you to a medical appointment. Um, driving, driving retirement, we might help you think about that or help you negotiate with your family. Often kids are more worried about their parents driving, then their parents are worried about driving. That can become an issue. As neutral assessors, as neutral people, we can help understand where the issues are. Is it safe, is it not? We can help you find alternate ways of getting places. Um, considering a move, where to live. Is where you're living still working, or is it time to give up the snow shovel and give up the shopping and the cleaning and think about an assisted living? We have relationships with many of the assisted livings in the area, and we have a lot of experience going into them and helping to, so we'd be able to, we're able to help you assess whether this would be a good fit. Do they have programs that would work for you? Do they have the care that you're gonna need? Um, that may not be what you want, so we work at home, work on making home safe. Uh, the other piece is the isolation, the, the maybe giving up your, the caregiving role or widowhood you know, later on, um, loss of partnership. Often it's hard, you feel very alone if you're the caregiver. You get very trapped if your partner might be someone might have some memory issues, they might wander, you might not feel that they're safe at home alone. That limits your ability to go out and have a rich life. Uh, so we help you find places, maybe in a, uh, an adult day health program. If you wanna stay at home, maybe for the day your spouse would go to uh, adult day health program with a program that specializes in memory care and that gives you a chance to relax and, and take care of yourself, because as we mentioned earlier, caregivers, if they're not taking care of themselves, and it's very difficult to do, often end up going before the identified sick person. So helping you find um, areas of where your partner, your spouse could go for the day for socialization, support groups, educational groups, all kinds of things like that. Um, we really do partner with you and help you figure out how to make the, your life as rich and joyful as possible and allow you as much as, as much as possible to be a spouse and not as much of a caregiver. Hi. Um, I don't have a lot of slides after this because um, it, it, I find it sometimes difficult not just to talk about what it is that we do, but the importance of it. So I have two stories, I'll make them quick, that I think illustrate, you know, uh, what we do in a, in a different way because you, you've heard a lot about the tasks that have to get done. They tend to get more complicated. You have more decisions to make as you get older. Should I do this? Should I have somebody else do this, et cetera? So we operate, again, on a different level. It's much more on um, a social and sometimes I would call an emotional level. One of my first clients was a neighbor who lived in Southboro, and unlike me, lived in one of the newer McMansions in Southboro. Uh, and uh, she lived with her uh, son and daughter-in-law, and at the time, uh, two, two boys who were in junior high and high school. And both the, her son and her daughter-in-law had executive jobs, so they were, they were gone a lot, they were in and out a lot, the boys were really, very busy, and um, she was there because she had been widowed. 
And she had been widowed about a year when, uh, when we started to do some work with her. Uh, and really what the, uh, what the, uh, uh, the son wanted was just somebody to come in, make lunch for her, uh, uh, have her help her walk around the, the neighborhood a little bit. She didn't use a walker, but she just didn't feel really steady going around by herself. And that was about it. I ended up bringing two different people in. We, all our caregivers worked part-time. They wanted somebody who was five days a week when they were gone a lot. And um, I, I learned a lesson really early on about this. And what I hadn't realized is that most of our caregivers are women. Most of the people we take, place, take care of are women. Not all, and men are certainly living longer. But both women that I had brought in were widows themselves. And uh, what my client talked to me about a month afterwards was is that she said, Doug, I haven't been able to talk to my family about how I feel about having my husband pass because I just didn't feel comfortable talking to my son about that and I didn't feel comfortable talking to my daughter-in-law about that. But they were able to really develop a really unique relationship because they, could sh they each could share their own stories about what, you know, what it was like. One, one had been a widow for about five years. One had been fairly recent herself. So it was a bonding that was really, really unusual. I, I don't think, as a matter of fact, I don't think it was that unusual, but it was really powerful for, for her. She ended up, uh, she had been uh, going to see a neuropsychologist for depression, and after about three months, he cut her medicine in half for depression because she just had, he just had somebody to talk to, somebody to be there that would listen to her and uh, give her some feedback as well, a little bit direction that she had nobody else to be able to do that, even though it was in a very active uh, household. Um, the other quick story is um, we met a gentleman who was just moving into an assisted living. And uh, he had to go to dialysis three times a week. Nobody likes going to dialysis. Uh, but, and I had two gentlemen who would take him. It was about a half hour drive there in the morning. They come back in the afternoon and pick him up and take him about half, half hour drive back. But he would say to me, he said to me, because I would substitute sometimes, he says, I love going to dialysis. I, talk, I hate dialysis, but I love going there because I get to talk to Bob or Jim. We talk about golf, we talk about sports, we talk about all kinds of things that nobody else in the assisted living, he, which were mostly women, that he could really talk about. <laughs> they had a great time going to that, even though it was a horrible place to go. And we did it for three years, and I, I got to know the family pretty well. His primary care uh, daughter, as a matter of fact, was in San Diego. So it was a lot of conversations with us on the phone or email. But when she came out her afterwards, he eventually got pneumonia and very sick and passed away, was how much that the quality of life really improved for him um, going back and forth. And dialysis obviously was a necessity, but the other piece of it was just so important uh, at, throughout the whole experience for him that she wouldn't know, she didn't think he would have been around as long if he didn't have somebody like that with him. So. Um, those are my stories, and that's what, that's what we do. It is, it's an intangible that's a little hard to put your fingers on sometimes, but um, it really is important because our, our whole purpose for all of us here is to make sure that regardless of your circumstances, um, you're living the best quality life that you can live. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. So Frank and Mary are in their 80s. They still want to stay home but they're going to need some assistance. So what can Bay Path help them with? We have a program called the State Home Care Program. This is funded by the state legislature, so it's your tax dollars at work. What we can provide under the State Home Care Program is a myriad of services. There is no income limit for our State Home Care Program. There used to be used to be that you had to be age, need, and income eligible. Now you only have to be age and need eligible. Big difference, because if you were $2 over that income cap, you couldn't get services. And that was hard for a lot of people because they still could not afford to private pay. But now the income cap is gone. 
That's really great news. So new in some of our programs, healthy living we can now provide as a service in our state home care program. Also, if you're on the waiver program, there is something new called the capable program, which teams a nurse up with an occupational therapist and a handyman to look at your home environment and help make the modifications needed for you to stay home safely. We also can provide you information and referral, which I talked about just a couple of minutes ago. Options counseling, because did you know you have options? You don't have to go to a nursing home. There are options out there, and we have trained people who can walk you through what your options might be. That's a totally free service. Information and referral is a totally free service. Caregiver program, totally free service. So many of our programs are free. Some have a, a, co a co-payment, such as the state home care program. But always is a wise thing to do is to call and ask us. So the services available under state home care program, case management. You work with a case manager to determine the services that you need, and we help get them set up. Personal care, homemaking, grocery shopping, medical transportation, adult day health, laundry, personal emergency response system. All of these are covered services under our state home care program. Now, there, if in the state home care program, there is a limit to the services that you can get every month because it is a capitated rate. But you can private pay beyond those hours or have a family member pay if you feel you need more. But it's a start. And we follow you on your journey to stay home. As you become, in, you, I say generically, become increasingly frail, or maybe have a hospitalization, we have other programs in state home care that give you a higher level of service. If you're on Medicaid, there's another program to give you a high level of service that could theoretically provide 24-7 care if you're on Mass Health. So it goes back to know us before you need us. Don't think that we have an income limit because we don't. Call our information and referral department, speak with one of our staff, and we're happy to send you any information that you might need. So I'm going to turn it back to Arthur. Oops. Thank you, Christine. And so many, many people just are not aware of, of the variety of programs that are available that are not asset-based, so you can qualify for them no matter what your amount of assets. And typically, there's, there's either a small copay, but they're not, but there's no cap regarding income. It's just, and, and that set of programs keeps on growing if you're Frank and Mary. So once again, if you're Frank and Mary, remember those, those were your assets, the house, the savings account, Frank's IRA, and Social Security. So just a couple of things to know from a kind of a, a legal perspective. One, if, if you're receiving that home care uh, because, you, is some, because either your doctor or a nurse or a social worker certifies that you need that home care to be at home because you either need at least assistance with at least two of the activities of daily living, which are eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, and transferring. Don't try to remember all of this. Just figure note to file, if you've got an issue, talk to your doctor or to a nurse or to a social worker. If, if someone is certifying that you need those services at home, then all the payment for all those services is tax deductible. That's really important for Frank and Mary and for most of you. If it is, my experience has been for folks it, it, right now, most of their money, most of their cash is in tax deferred funds. And so they don't want to pull it out because then they have to pay the tax. Except if you're getting services at home, that means that if you pull it out, you, you're, and to use the services, you, your tax deduction for your medical is gonna be equal to the income tax you would have paid on the income that you pulled out. So it ends up that you end up using 100% of those dollars. It's not like you're pulling them out and having to pay a big tax bill. Um, Long-term care insurance is a big deal at this point if you've got it. I always tell people the biggest reason to get long-term care insurance is not to pay for nursing home care because typically the premium is too high to get a policy big enough to pay for the nursing home. It's to pay for this kind of home care. Also, as Christine mentioned, there is this wonderful state-funded program um, in which there is a small copay that can give you some hours of services at home. Uh, to the extent that you need a lot of care at home, you can still qualify. And, for, and either Frank or Mary could qualify in that case. In order for them to qualify for that more extensive program, 
Um, say Mary really needed a lot of care. She needed to show that she, need, she had less than $2,000 in countable assets. But Frank is still alive. So Mary could, the day before she wanted to apply for that program, simply shift all of her assets to Frank. And then she could qualify for the program as soon as Frank does some things. Frank would have to show that, he ha that first of all, he can own the house no matter what the value, even though she just transferred it to him. Uh, he can have other cash or cash equivalent assets equal to $126,420, even though the money just got transferred to him. Now, he has more than that, right? Remember, his IRA plus the cash was more than that. But he can take the extra money, the money over that amount, and buy an annuity with it because he is allowed to have unlimited income as the healthy spouse. He can have unlimited income. So he could buy an annuity with that as long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that does not exceed Frank's actuarial life expectancy. The day after he buys the annuity, Mary can qualify for that program, for the Frail Elder Pro Waiver Program. So, and, and remember, at this point, they didn't have to do any asset restructuring beforehand. Remember, I talked about that when they were 70. This can all be done at the last minute. It's really, really important. So, for qualifying for the Frail Elder Waiver, there is no look back period regarding asset shifting to a spouse. You can't give it away to your kids, but you can give it away to a spouse. Uh, the healthy spouse can buy an annuity and then talk to your lawyer. The reason why you want to talk to your lawyer is because we love talking to you. No, it, it's because the um, other thing that you would probably want to do with that case, in the, at this point, right, or that Frank and Mary want to be considering doing as, as they're, now that, as they're getting older, um, is while Frank and Mary are both safe in terms of protecting their assets if one of them needs a nursing home while they're both alive, Remember, and I was assuming that Frank and Mary's estate plan is if one of them dies, the other one gets all the assets. They own everything jointly. If that happened, if Frank died and Mary then, and Mary then had all the assets, and then Mary needed to qualify for MassHealth because she wanted to be on the Frail Elder Waiver or for any other program, she'd have a problem because now she'd have all these assets and she'd be way over $2,000. The way they that Frank and Mary can take care of that, though, is very simple. All they have to do is have wills that say, when I die, all the assets that were going to go to my spouse, I want instead to go and trust for the benefit of my spouse. They can name one of their kids or anybody else, for that matter, as the trustee, although typically it's like the trusted child. As long as they structure things that way, any assets owned by that first spouse to die will be immediately safe, non-countable, and non-lienable if the surviving spouse needs to qualify for mass health. And in the meantime, while Frank and Mary were both alive, they can just keep control of all of their assets as long as they make sure they shift them before the first spouse dies in order to protect the other spouse. It's like a, and, and then when, after the second spouse has died, all that money that was in trust would simply get divided up among the kids or go wherever they wanted them to go. One other point, um, people are always Whenever I suggest assisted living, go, oh, it just costs way too much money. How am I ever going to afford that? So you got to go do the numbers. You have to go do the numbers. I mean, assume, this is a very, this is a fairly expensive assisted living. Assume that Frank and Mary, that they, if they were looking for an assisted living, it had a cost of $8,000 a month. Remember, though, their income is, is $3,000 a month from Social Security. So their burn rate, the rate at which their savings will get down is $5,000 a month or $60,000 a year. If their assets are $600,000, then that's 10 years in the assisted living. At this point, their actuarial life expectancy for each of them is lower than 10 years. And the likelihood is that if they were living longer than that, chances are they may very well need nursing home care. So chances are that Frank and Mary could afford to move to an assisted living. And to some extent, how can they afford not to? There is a point at which it just isn't safe to be at home. So you really need to kind of be looking at that alternative. Uh, I just want to mention, go back to one other slide, that. Um, so I didn't bring a lot of the nursing home related stuff up when Frank and Mary were 70, just because of this. So if you are, if you are according to the Alzheimer's Association, if you are 65, the likelihood that you are going to end up with the disease that causes dementia and in a nursing home for some period of time is one in nine. Your chances are one in nine. If you're 85, they're one in three. And that's the reason why once you get to be 80, most folks who are coming in to talk, or to, to talk about planning are talking about figuring out how to deal with that nursing home issue. 
But what I always tell them is, if you're married, you're both still alive, you don't have to be giving all your assets away, you don't have to be waiting five years, you don't have to do any of that stuff. You can just structure things so that when the first one dies, the other one is going to be safe. Um, so, uh, if this is a lot, I covered a lot, we tried to cover a lot of material here. If you've got other questions, thank you very, very much. Well, first of all, thank you to Chris Lindquist from the library for allowing us to continue to come here to do these presentations. Thanks a million to the folks at Northbrook Cable who play this a lot, you know, because a, a lot of this presentation is for people who can't be here because they're at home, because they need to be at home, taking care of, often taking care of their spouse. Uh, it, so they'll replay it if you want to see it again. Also, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel for Elder Law Frank and Mary, and you can see it there. And could I ask for a round of applause for my wonderful guests for today?